So I'm going to start today by asking the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, as I said, my name is Nick Adams. I work for GLAAD. GLAAD is a, a national nonprofit organization that works on LGBT media advocacy. So we work specifically with the media to help them do a better job of telling stories about the LGBTQ community. I'm the director of GLAAD's transgender media program and a transgender man myself. So now I'm going to ask the other panelists to introduce themselves, starting with my boss. Oh, hi. Hi, welcome. I'm Sarah Kate Ellis. I'm the president and CEO of GLAAD. I've been there about three years. GLAAD, as Nick said, is a media advocacy organization, and I spent the first couple of decades of my life in media working um, for magazines and digital properties. I'm Sean Rad. I am the founder and chairman of Tinder. Uh, we've, we've done some exciting things, I think, for the transgender community and excited to talk about it. I'm Zachary Drucker. I am a real, live transgender woman. <laughs> I'm a producer on the show Transparent and an advocate and activist in the community for the past 10 years. So before we get into talking about uh, the work that Tinder and Glad did together, we want to show you a short video that uh, outlines some of the things. And we made this video last fall when, when they launched the new gender feature on Tinder. So we're going to start by taking a look at the video. I'm a blogger, and I'm transgender. I'm a full-time model, and I identify as male. I'm a DJ and a philanthropist, and I'm a female gender. I'm a makeup artist, cosmetic trainer. I identify as male, for now. Currently working full-time with Slay Model Management, and I identify as female. Media advocate and trans activist, I am a transgender woman. DJ and actor, and I identify as trans female. Artist, a producer on the show Transparent. I'm a trans woman. I'm an artist and a publisher. I am a man of transgender experience. I'm an actor and I'm a trans woman. I am a TV writer. My uh, preferred gender is a gender, no gender. Tinder's been great for a lot of trans people, but for some trans people, they've had issues with users who are misusing the system to report people just for being trans. Tinder has been working hard this year to close that gap. There is still stigma associated with the notion of dating a trans person. They were not able to have the same experience with Tinder that non-transgender users could have. People think it's okay to ask certain questions and they're just generally very disgusting and offensive. I just had to explain so much and I just got sick of it so I just stopped. I would be reported and then I would be blocked from Tinder for a few days. I was honestly very disappointed. We had to invest the time to meet with our users, activists in the community, organizations like GLAAD, to make sure that we understand the full breadth of what we have to do to build a great experience. Also have the option of saying, I am also trans, and put whatever word you'd like, so you can really tailor Tinder to your specific needs. It makes me feel like I can actually step forward being myself. It's easier for me to connect with someone when I'm standing in my truth. Everyone has the right to be who they are and meet someone great who loves them for who they are. So I want to start um, talking to Sean first. You first announced that you were going to work on making Tinder more trans inclusive almost a year ago, I think. Yep. And can you talk about how it sort of came to Tinder's attention that transgender users were perhaps not being as well served by the platform as they could be? Yeah, we've uh, you know, we, we heard or the first time I heard about it. Um, was over a year ago, some of the community monitoring team were telling us that there were transgender users who were getting harassed uh, and then banned from Tinder because uh, they were getting reported and the community moderation team didn't know what to do, but they were getting reported on the, on the merits of who they were, not because they did anything bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that was horrible. Like I was horrified when I, heard, when I first heard of this and, and you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely wrong. And, as we were thinking about what we could do about it, we had a hackathon uh, and a team within the company came up with uh, a great first start to a solution. Um, and once I saw that, I'm like, okay, like I think the whole company was inspired to work on this um, and we started a journey uh, to, to start solving these issues um, and ending harassment in all forms on the platform. Cool. 
So there may be some people in this room who don't have Tinder on their phone, although I think that's very unlikely. Um, so for those of you who may not have Tinder on your phone, and I don't want to speak for Sean, but I'm going to briefly say this is how I wrap my mind around it, because I'm an old married man who's been with my partner, John, for 15 years, so I didn't have Tinder on my phone originally, <laughs> um, but now I do. So now I know that um, when you go on Tinder, you can find people around you who are also on Tinder, and there's really only three things that Tinder looks for in terms of finding matches for you, which is the age range you've specified, how far that person is away from you geographically, and whether or not you, le you are looking for men or women or both. That was where the app was about about a year ago when we started. Um, and when you signed up for Tinder and made your profile, you had to pick, I am a man or I am a woman. So that's kind of just a quick synopsis of where we were a year ago. So can you um, talk about um, the changes that were made to the app to make it more trans-inclusive? Totally. Um, so you're right, that's where, that's where Tinder was prior to these changes. Uh, we, made, we made four primary changes. Number one, um, you can now pick uh, from any gender. So, so you can identify however you want on Tinder. Mm -hmm. um, and we've worked with Glad um, and, and different people in the community to figure out, so give, give sort of suggestions based on what the most popular genders are, but then also really allow the community to pick whatever they want. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is you could display that gender on your profile. And what this does, it eliminates some of the confusion and we believe prevents some of the harassment. I mean, it's definitely some of the feedback we heard from users in the community that part of the harassment stemmed from um, it not being sort of clear uh, what people were looking for and who they were up front. So this allows you to sort of put that, that forward. Second, the, the third thing is, I think we really took this as an opportunity to educate our users. Um, so education could be productized. And we found different places in the app where we're able to um, talk about uh, gender inclusivity, gender diversity, and the importance to Tinder and to the world. And we sort of use the app to educate our users on that. And the fourth thing, um, really working with our community moderation team to, um, to helping, help them get, have better skills to deal with this, these types of reports. You know, incidences where people are getting reported for um, the wrong reason and how they can actually identify it, how they can deal with it. Because, you know, we have great algorithms that help um, uh, the community moderation team, but at the end of the day, you can't, you know, no algorithm is going to solve for uh, humans. Mm -hmm. And then you, you sort of need that human touch, and, 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 and you know, we, we needed our team to sort of empathize and understand how to deal with these things. Great. You mentioned that it started with a hackathon within Tinder, and then um, eventually Glad was brought in to kind of work with the tech team to, about what the details of it might look like. And we had previously worked with Facebook at Glad to help them change their gender options as well, because on Facebook you also used to have to pick from two options. Then they added a list of long words, like 50 some words, and then eventually they moved to an open field where you can put in anything you want. And I was impressed that the first day when I got to Tinder, uh, it was already clear that you had gone to the open field, that you weren't going to try to force people to pick from a preconceived list that you were already there in terms of realizing that people can put a whatever term in if they want. Um, how did it come about that Tinder wanted to work with trans, not only GLAD, but other trans people in the community as well to kind of create the details of what this app looked like? Like, why was it important to Tinder to bring trans people into the process? Totally. So as we started to work on the problem ourselves, we realized, um, I think we were sort of taken aback at how complex identity is. <laughs> um, the changes we've made seem simple. Uh, in hindsight, they look simple, but, but, but it, it was, it, it is, it's a very complex area. Um, and at the same time, Tinder is extremely simple. So we pride ourselves on having a very simple app that everyone understands how to use. So to take something that complex, and distill it down to sort of simple principles that all of our community can understand was a huge challenge. Um, <clears throat> we tried, and then we were like, oh shit, we need help. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we reached out to GLAD and, um, and you know, Andrew James and Zachary and other influencers that, that were able to help us uh, really get, number one, sort of understand 
the, the, the issues and how to best approach them. But also I think another component was like developing empathy for these users. Um, you know, we would sort of read these reports and we would talk to some of these users in passing. But I think for me personally, one of the most valuable thing was to have an opportunity to, to really hear these stories um, because that allowed us to build a better product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Sarah Kate, Glad's work is culture change yeah. and sort of um, changing people's attitudes and opinions by using the power of the media um, about what it means to be an LGBTQ person. So what do you think it means when companies like Tinder send this message to their users and to the world that transgender people are welcome on that platform? Um, so I think it sends a big message of acceptance um, and for multiple reasons. Number one is that when you look at the next generation today, you look at how youth are dating and meeting people and how they identify. There's, you know, youth today, and we have a report coming out shortly, so I can't really share it too much of it, but are way more open and non-binary, um, meaning that they don't live in checking the box and seeing the world through just male and female or yes and no. Uh, they live in this gray area a lot more. And so I think in order for a dating app or an app about meeting people to open and welcome everyone is critical and essential um, in today's environment. And, and also for such a leadership position, because yes, you appeal to a younger audience, yet you have an older audience that is might be financing and 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 is pulling a lot of the, the strings at the, the highest levels. And so you really have to bridge that gap. And so the education from a from a GLAD <coughs> standpoint is is phenomenal because not only are you now welcoming and accepting all of these users, but then you're also educating this whole other audience that really needs education around the trans community. And so um, I think it's really, really important. And I think that um, it, it trans community, the trans community can be so marginalized already. And so to, to be additive to that just by not addressing some what turn out to be complex in issues to make simple, but really simple issues at the at the end of the day, is it doesn't help anyone. Um, it targets a community and it makes them feel unwelcome, and it and it and it adds to a marginalized community. So I'm really proud of what they did at Tinder, and I'm really excited that they reached out to us. So I appreciate that, um, and I think you know it. I just have to say this too, because we're sitting here in Texas right now talking about trans issues, um, and I'm an activist. <laughs> but there is a big trans issue here in Texas right now. There's a Senate bill that's moving through the legislation process. It's called SB6. And basically, what it does is the North Carolina state bill, which. Um, Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, so please speak up and out about it. It is a terrible, terrible bill. And at the end of the day, what it does is it targets trans youth. Um, it, it, it's about, you know, public accommodations and just letting people exist in public um, without being harassed unduly. And so we're really active on that right now. And I just had to get that in because it's burning yes. inside of me. Because, yes. <laughs> Yes, because you can't talk about transgender inclusion and transgender acceptance without talking about the political landscape in which we're living right now. And I think when there are certain people trying to promote legislation like HB2 or SB6 here in Texas, um, or the decision by the Trump administration to rescind the Department of Justice and the Department of Education guidelines on how to treat trans kids equally in school, you know, I think that we're currently in a culture that is trying to take steps to send acceptance for transgender people back in time rather than forward in time, uh, particularly coming from some politicians. So if, to me, it's even more important during this period of time that companies like Tender and other companies Absolutely. step up, step forward, and say that, you know, that welcome and inclusion of 
all communities, and from my perspective, particularly transgender people, is critically important. So yeah, we thank Tender for that. There's also an, uh, an organization here in Texas called Texas Competes, which is having companies come on board and letting the Texas legislature know that this bill, SB6, which basically says transgender people have to use the bathroom that matches the you know, gender marker on their birth certificate. So it's very similar to HB2 in North Carolina. And it also says that cities in Texas, like Dallas or Austin, cannot pass non-discrimination protections that would be broader than the statewide protection, which is nothing. So it's a really problematic bill and um, applies to schools as well, so it would set back transgender students also. So there was you know, 13 hours of hearings on that <coughs> on Tuesday, um, and there will be more upcoming <coughs> next week. So yeah, if you do live in Texas and you can care about this issue, let your legislators know that SB6 is not good for Texas and definitely not good for transgender people. Um, but <laughs> back to, um, back to the, the, what Tender is doing to make the world a better place for transgender people, and we're glad. Um, we talked about kind of the solution to the problem that Tinder came up with in terms of the challenges that transgender people were having dating uh, and using the platform. And I'd like to ask Zachary if she can talk more about what does the dating landscape look like for transgender people? Like I said, old married man, I've been with John 16 years, so it's been a long time, thank God, since I was out in the dating world. But um, can you talk more about kind of what that landscape is like, either on apps or in real life for transgender people? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's important to set some groundwork, too, for where the trans community is today and where we're coming from. So we've always existed. We were present in ancient civilizations. Even in the Talmud, there's 11 genders. Um, many indigenous populations in different parts of the world had multiple genders. And then with colonization came a binary that was kind of imposed, um, which was uh, you know, a Western import. Um, we have existed in, by hiding in plain sight oftentimes, so trans folks have been creatures of the night or they've been um, not visible, not visibly trans. Um, whether folks know it or not, you've met trans people and there are trans people among you. Um, but I think that there is a lack of exposure to our stories and who we are. So I'm a culture worker. I work on a TV show that really is centered around a few trans characters, uh, one in particular. Um, and I think that narrative and getting to know somebody um, is the best way to build empathy. Um, now, there's always been a secret and concealed consumption of trans bodies. Um, one realm that we see that is pornography, um, where there's a fast growing kind of uh, category of, of trans people in pornography. That's been around for a long time. Um, and then because of the obstacles that trans people face, like employment discrimination, um, lack of family acceptance, lack of access to higher education, trans folks historically have been forced into the underground economy. So survival sex, sex work, and these issues are particularly compounded by race and class. Um, there is a pandemic of violence against black trans women, um, trans women of color particularly. Um, and last year there was 27 murders, the year before there was 21, this year there's already been eight, seven. seven. Um, and I think that, uh, to get back to your question, Nick, there, uh, you know, there, there's always been this sort of arena where trans people have existed, where um, men have participated in our existence. Um, without kind of being allies. Mm -hmm. um, so how does this manifest in dating? I think uh, dating apps of years past, um, there was sort of, you know, a small group of niche dating sites that would kind of allow users to connect with trans people specifically that really mirrored the ways in which culturally we were being treated as marginal, as isolated, as separate. 
Um, and I think that the founding, you know, the kind of foundational principle that we're talking about here of having trans folks in the mix, like a part of the world, no longer kind of separate and on the sides is enormous. Like it's actually really impossible to quantify how huge that is when we have always existed, um, sort of hidden, kept away, for us to be out there identifying openly as who we are. I think that we've gained cultural legitimacy over the past four years with things like Orange is the New Black and Laverne Cox on the cover of Time and Caitlyn Jenner. Um, and I think that's helped kind of raise uh, the kind of profile of, of trans folks in the country. Um, but ultimately, we're not yet, uh, I think, seen as human to a large percentage of the world, which is what's enabling this sort of uh, conservative movement to discredit our existence, to gaslight the, the country into thinking that they're supporting something else, mm -hmm. right? Which is men not being in women's bathrooms, which is really a way of saying that, you know, that I'm a man. Um, yeah, I threw a lot out there, sorry. <laughs> No, are you, I, I'm like over here nodding like I cannot agree with enough with everything you said. So thank you for throwing all that out there because I think it's yeah. very important and really powerful. And it's funny because when I started working with Tinder, I had a steep learning curve to understand how the app worked and why this was as complicated as it turned out to be. I was in endless meetings with Drew, who's a brilliant engineer. And we were like, what? Like how did, but as I worked on it, I began really clearly to realize that while this was kind of initially brought to us as a way to make transgender people feel more welcome on Tinder and to make it more um, responsive to the needs of transgender users, which was great, to me what eventually really began to dawn on me was that this message that was sent out to all Tinder users, how many are there? Uh, we don't say exactly, but it's <laughs> tens of millions. Tens of high, millions. High tens of millions. High tens of millions of Tinder users <laughs> was the message that transgender people are not only like welcome on this platform, but they're part of the fabric of our lives, they're part of the fabric of our dating pool, and that everybody should just be fine with that. And that no longer would transgender people be you know, banned from Tinder simply for being transgender, which was never the intention, but due to the reporting system right. ended up happening. Um, to me, that message was so powerful to say to people, you know, yeah, you're gonna, when you're swiping through, you're gonna see transgender people on this app and big deal. Move on if they're not interested or swipe if you are because you might be somebody beautiful like Zachary who's super smart. Um, so I really, as that really dawned on me as we worked on the project, I was like, this is really exciting. Really exciting because it is great to have TV programs out there that people can watch, and that's incredibly important. But there's a certain self selection, too, about who watches Transparent or who watches other shows that are trans inclusive. But like everybody's on Tinder. <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. Excuse me. Some I, water. I had a cough. I'm <laughs> uh, but everybody is on Tinder, like a giant cross section of people. So to send the message out through that platform, to make it just seem matter of fact that trans people exist and you might actually date and fall in love with one, I think was a really powerful message to send. Um, so thank you for everything that you just said. And again, coming back to like, that's why I think it's so important what Tender did. You know, I just want to jump off that for a second, Nick. Um, looking at the LGBTQ movement, um, especially um, the gay movement, the, the early s stages of the gay movement, it really was about visibility. And if you knew someone who was gay, you realized that like they weren't this beast that lived in the closet, that it was someone like me who has a wife and children. It was your neighbor or your sister or your brother or your uncle. And so, building empathy and learning people's stories and realizing that gay people were within your community was such a big, powerful part of our movement. And it really was about visibility. And we, we at, at, and Harvey Milk, you know, decades ago was about get out there and come out. And so to have a, a platform like Tinder, allowing that visibility for the trans community 
as we're saying here, is such a remarkable step forward within the movement and within trans visibility and acceptance and, and now, you know, treating trans people as they should be as part of the community as just everyday people as opposed to keeping them in the shadows of this community of this society is really a, is where we start to build the empathy and we start to build acceptance um, and and so I agree with you like telling the stories at glad we're 30 years old we've always been about storytelling that's our that's our thing because um, we know once you change a heart and mind um, once you learn someone's story that mind and heart is changed forever you can't hate somebody whose story you know mm -hmm. um, and tinder is that story right like tinder is a story about connecting people and meeting people and visibility for people and so it's so interesting as we evolve as a community as a society and technology um, and that social platforms now become storytelling platforms or continue to be storytelling platforms and dating apps or connecting apps now are places where we can grow visibility of people who are typically marginalized is really a powerful thing um, and and just like Facebook and just like tinder um, doing that more and more really it I, I, it's a beautiful thing for this country honestly and to just jump off of what Sarah Kate said briefly I mean I think that visibility for transgender people is 20 to 25 years behind where visibility is for LGB people and so today well so I'm again old so I'm old enough to remember that like in the 80s, all gay men were pedophiles. That's just what people thought were true, was true. That was the myth that society promulgated that gay men should not be around children, it wasn't safe, they shouldn't be teachers, they shouldn't be Boy Scout leaders, they shouldn't be around, you know, it was not, they were just predators, right? And we have so far moved beyond that largely in how the world sees gay men. Um, the world has realized that lesbians and by, to a lesser extent that bisexual people exist. And we see a variety of media images about that side of the community. So again, back in 30 years ago, if there was a gay character on television and you were gay, like you rushed to watch that show, right? It was the only thing out there that you could see. And that's kind of where we are with transgender media images today and, and also to society's myths and misconceptions about who transgender people are. So with the increasing visibility, there are certain people out there now trying to paint transgender people as predators, transgender people as deviants, transgender people as something to be afraid of in the public bathroom or whatever, or not shouldn't be around children. So it's just kind of like reliving that all over again, but now in 2017 instead of 1987, and we are using the power of the media to tell trans people stories to undo those myths and preconceived notions. Um, and we're still at the point though when there's a transgender character on television, we rush to see it. Like, you know, there's not that many. I can count on two hands the number of transgender characters on TV and none in film. So we have such a long way to go. Like right now on TV, if you don't like Mitch and Cam on Modern Family, you can turn the channel and watch the guys on How to Get Away with Murder, or you can turn and watch the lesbian drama on Grey's Anatomy. You have a variety of different types of LGB characters that you can look to to kind of see your story reflected or who might seem like people in your family. But with transgender characters in the media, we don't have that. So any type of visibility that shows who transgender people really are and that we're just part of the fabric of society is really critical. Um, again, that's why we were thrilled to work with Tender and why, as the director of GLAD's transgender media program, I am constantly taking meetings and calls with people, both in journalism, because we want to make sure that those stories are fair and accurate as well, and representing kind of the social issues that people face, like Zachary talked about, the poverty, the discrimination, and the violence. And then on the other side, working with media content creators to help them do a better job of creating multidimensional human, um, authentic portrayals of who transgender people are. Because I do think, like Sarah Kate said, that's how we make cultural change. That's how we let people know the reality of trans existence. Um, so that was my little soapbox moment. Uh, so, um, now it's about four months since the gender feature update was launched, which was the week after the election, uh, which made it seem even more critically important. Um, can you talk to us about sort of like what the results have been and uh, how people have used the feature? Does Tinder see any change in terms of their trans users or the culture? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's first of all, it's, we sent, I think, an important message. You guys hear me? 
uh, we send an important message <clears throat> not only to the community but to our, our internal employees. Mm -hmm. um, but really, like you know, when we were when we were doing this, it was very important that we built a feature that works. Um, so so the success metrics. You, know, you definitely you can look at them as sort of, did we successfully set an example and send a message that I think we did, but also look at the product and say, you know, are, are we actually building a better product for transgender users? And I think we are. I mean, we've, since we've launched this, we've had 250,000 uh, matches. Um, uh, there have been 250,000 matches with transgender users on Tinder. Um, so yeah. That's, that's, uh, so you know that's that's a big step to building a more inclusive community, um, and you know for us it is it is about inclusivity. It is very important that we set an example to our users, to our employees that you know Tinder is about everyone and everyone's welcome and everyone deserves to meet someone special. Um, so I think it's awesome that you have transgender users who are using it as a platform to meet someone great. Mm -hmm. great. Okay. Um, should we look at questions? Sure. Or, or does anybody else want to say anything? I mean, I'm sort of moderating and paneling here at the same time. I can throw a few thoughts in. I mean, I think that, because um, I didn't totally answer your question also <laughs> about the experience of dating mm -hmm. while trans and what the sort of obstacles and impediments are. Um, I think that when you have a concealed population and a whole kind of like economy around um, consuming trans bodies, um, it creates this kind of barrier between people, right? So you have like, and I'm speaking specifically, I guess, to like trans women and men right now, but trans men have the same problems dating, I think, with men. I think the common denominator is cisgender men, so non-trans <laughs> men. Um, but ultimately it's like, uh, I think, uh, really deeply Im embedded kind of uh, fear of having your heterosexuality compromised, mm -hmm. um, having your heteronormativity kind of threatened by, uh, you know, like the rigid confines of straightness, which are not realistic. It's not like a black and white world that we're living in anymore. This is like full color, HD, <laughs> about to be 3D, <laughs> virtual reality. Um, why would we only have two genders? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but I think that, you know, one thing that trans women experience, for example, is um, men not wanting to meet them in public. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, meeting a man in public and then kind of like working your way up to uh, dating or a romantic moment that's sort of, uh, you know, you have to drop a bomb at some point if they don't read you as trans and disclose. and. I would say like a third to a half of the time you experience rejection. So just imagine that all, all of you cisgender folks out there that like you meet somebody, you have chemistry, everything's going great, you're totally getting along, and then some central part of who you are is a deal breaker, is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm not saying that that doesn't happen for other reasons, um, you know, in other people's lives, but I think for, for trans folks, it's, you know, um, who we are. Um, and then by not being seen as viable partners or mates, um, there's, and I think because of the propensity of like pornography and all of that, things kind of very quickly go to a sexual place instead of a romantic or sustainable kind of trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, so you never have like a sort of fair shot at finding love. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes back to the stigma associated with being transgender. So people then, if they find themselves attracted to someone who is transgender, worry about that stigma affecting them. What will their family think? What will their friends think? What will their coworkers think? And if we can undo some of that stigma about what it means to be transgender, then perhaps people will not have that, oh my God, this is a deal breaker moment where they run away or worst case scenario, react violently when somebody discloses to them that they're transgender um, is part of it. And then. You know, I think also underlying it is that uh, 
society has a very hard time sort of taking transgender people at their word that we are who we say that we are. So especially <coughs> transgender women who are constantly having their femininity and their womanhood challenged and questioned. So if you are someone who cannot see a transgender woman as a woman and you and somehow think that she's really a man, quote unquote, then I think for some, fortunately, some straight, non-transgender men, it throws their own sexual orientation into question in their mind, like, oh, does this make me gay? Which it does not. People still conflate sexual orientation and gender in this way that is very muddled in their minds, which is why it's so important to explain to them, like, gender identity is who you are. Sexual orientation is who you're attracted to. They are two separate things. So I think that, like, fundamentally underlying that is like this stigma about being transgender or being attracted to someone who's trans and also this weird homophobia that lingers around self-internalized like if I date a trans woman does that make me gay which makes no sense um, my partner John's a gay man and he worried that when he started dating me that somebody was going to come take his gay card away he worried that for like two hours and then he was <laughs> over it which is why we're still together uh, but he did have that in his mind you know so I think that like as the further that we can untangle for people the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity the more it can help undo that stigma and make it clear that we are just part of the culture you might find yourself falling in love with us you know and even though you haven't said so I will say so that this type of transphobia and this type of stigma and this type of reaction so much more disproportionately affects transgender women um, than it does transgender men. We have our own issues with people dating us or how we date and so on and so forth, but the brunt of the transphobia in this culture is unfortunately targeted at trans women. Um, transgender men largely are invisible. Um, people don't even know we exist. And so our struggle mostly is to kind of help people see, yes, we do exist, we're right here, but um, I would rather have that problem than deal with the tremendous amount of like just transphobia and stigma and violence that's directed at trans women. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to talk about the broader kind of political landscape and the kind of um, increasing necessity for, for corporate responsibility mm -hmm. um, in the absence of a responsible government that's looking out for all of its citizens. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's imperative that um, you know individuals as well as companies um, use their political, social, and economic influence to err on the side of um, moral integrity. Yes, I agree. and we are seeing that here mm -hmm. in Texas, um, and we're seeing it. I agree. <coughs> And someone who works to help companies leverage that often and a, a lot of times, um, we, we do see that fairly often. Um, and and um, we're, st we're already seeing it here in Texas where um, sports teams, artists, music artists, actors who are from here and corporates have signed on to say that, you know, they will reconsider their business here um, if they pass SB6. So um, I, I've found that um, the communities of the different industries have been quite supportive along the way. And, um, you know, North Carolina is close to losing one billion dollars over the decision to push through that legislation. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big price to pay, not to mention all the reputational damage now, that it's unwelcoming that, you know, the heart of the South is now, uh, you know, frowning upon others um, and othering complete societies that don't, or complete groups of people that don't need to be othered. And so um, we do need to rely more on corporate citizens these days. Um, when 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 we don't feel like we're through our politicians are being supported in the LGBTQ community, and that's why apps like Tinder taking on this and and being proactive in this, um, because what I find very interesting about what you guys did was, um, and and maybe you can elaborate on this a little bit more is that that we weren't at your front door with. Pictures. Forks. And I'm usually there with the pitchforks, so I know. Um, not, I hadn't even identified it, or we hadn't identified it as as an issue yet. Um, for us, it's still low-hanging fruit, like visibility, and so we hadn't even made it to a dating app. Um, 
and you guys proactively took this on, which is incredibly commendable. And I, I'm curious, like, what was that that well, I think incited it, that? It, it, it was the advocacy within our company. Mm. Um, but I think maybe also a philosophy that at least I've always seen my role and the and anyone in leadership, your job is sort of to listen to your community, right? Mm -hmm. You're representing a group of individuals. And, you know, in, in, in Tinder's case, you're representing tens of millions of people and you want to do what's right by all of them and also the overall ecosystem. So I think in a way, um, I think these corporate leaders need to recognize they are in a way political leaders. Like you're representing right. an audience that is connected with you and looking to you um, uh, for certain parts of their lives and you have a responsibility there. So I think, you know, I've always felt that um, and I think people in the com company have felt that. So whenever there's a problem with something happening with our users to the extent that we can help, we have to. Mm -hmm. We have responsibility to. Right. That's great. That's fantastic. And then I'm curious. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> did you find any backlash? I see it's one of the questions as well. Did you feel that there was backlash? Did you have it internally? I'm curious both externally and internally within the organization and outside of the organization. Great, great question. So. Um, I think the, the the backlash isn't necessarily what you would expect. I think there was there were some people who were questioning whether you know, given all the things that we have to do, is this the highest of priorities? We have limited resources, and um, I think that uh, was where we set an example to say, hey, we're this isn't low priority because it impacts less. You know, like it's not a huge, nice, shiny feature that can help. Um, you know create the next big innovation like that that this is an area where you have to innovate and that you know i think it sent a message to the company that anything that helps our users particularly when it comes to safety particularly when it comes to ending harassment is a priority it's a number one priority um and, and so you know some of the backlash was on prioritization um and then you know there wasn't more backlash there, there was a lot of curiosity and i think lack of awareness mm -hmm. throughout the company mm. um and i think that was that was probably the 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 best part of this whole experience was i think just watching like we all kind of learned about um uh gender issues and how complex it is together as a company and um and like you said, it's like you have to hear these stories to really empathize with them and to really connect with them and meet, meet individuals who experience um, these troubles. And, and so I think over time, it became even more and more personal mm -hmm. to every individual in the company, which is awesome. I wonder if it's possible, too, that you know, backlash is actually a product of success. Like if backlash is a part and parcel of when something is kind of like successfully made an impact on the social fabric of the world. I think it's so commendable that Tinder, I mean, I think that part of being a human is uh, looking out for other humans. Mm -hmm. And I think that not um, sort of waiting for the SS to show up at your front door, you know, and look, but instead looking out for the, the global community, the human community, the people who are around you. Um, I think the thing that was so absent from the trans community for so long was allies. Um, and the, the fact that people outside the trans community weren't really standing up for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest game changer over the past three years has been the sort of arrival of responsible humans and allies kind of standing with us mm -hmm. um, and to have like a huge company like Tinder with a t like tremendous amount of influence in so many different ways. I mean, economically, socially, politically um, is just the biggest kind of validating stamp of approval for our community. And it's uh, right on time. It's exactly what we need. Mm. You know, we, we are running, we have about 10 minutes left and I see the questions down here. So we, uh, we started with one of the questions and I'm gonna go on and look at the, one of the other questions down here. And it's really about um, 
the fact that there are so many binary options in so many of our lives, like as trans people everywhere you go, you, when there's that box on the form and it's like male and female and there's two boxes and you're expected to check one, uh, and that's true on social media platforms um, as well in many cases. And so um, one of the things I just want to say broadly, really clearly, is that you know, um, Western culture in particular, as Zachary mentioned, has this notion that there are two boxes, male and female. And over the last few years, people have begun to realize that you may have you know, been born in this box, but you've moved to this box, or vice versa. But the reinforcing notion is still somehow that there's two boxes. And transgender people will tell you that gender is much more diverse than that and cannot be limited to this notion that there are two boxes. So to think of gender as more of a spectrum or as more of a galaxy of ways and manifestations that people can both express their gender and also kind of identify their gender is part of the educational process. And like we've made headway on the, oh, you might have been in one binary box and now you're in the other binary box. But making, we won't stop working until we can make it more clear to people that there are no boxes. Um, and that was one of the things about Tinder and working with Facebook that was so great was because, you know, um, some well-intentioned, like a, companies and schools will say male, female, transgender, as if it's like a third box. No, not helpful. Or then there's a thing like, well, there's a list of terms and 50 terms. And that is also not really helpful because sometimes, you know, gender, your gender can be as unique as your fingerprint for some people, you know, and they were not going to find one of those 50 terms that fits them. So to have both Facebook and Tinder eventually come to this place where it's an open field and you can write in the word that you feel best describes you is part of the education process of letting people know that it's not, too, you know, it's not now three boxes or it's not 50 boxes. It's how you identify. So to me, again, when we first walked in and Tinder was like, oh, no, we're already there. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like, I don't even have to have that conversation with you now, which was great. Um, let's see what else. Oh, there's one here. To Sean, what are the investment plan? What? what? Oh. Sean, can yes. you read that? Uh, <laughs> what are investment plans lot. for Swipe Venture? I can. Okay, New okay. acquisitions make Tinder more inclusive and better. Oh, great question. Um, yeah, what, what we're doing with Swipe Ventures is um, Tinder, Tinder has, we're, we're in a fortunate position where we have a lot of capital. Um, and, uh, but we also have limited resources. And a lot of the, the Tinder resources are uh, currently working on what I would say are like our one-year plans. Um, and, but they're sort of like big dreams that we have and sort of the, the five to 10 year vision of what Tinder is. And one of the ways we can go out there <clears throat> and realize that vision is through acquisition and through, through companies that sort of have the flexibility to think more uh, long-term and not sort of solve our immediate um, challenges. And that's, that's what I'm focusing on with Swipe Ventures. I think to the extent that long term we live in a world that is more inclusive then you know hopefully you know as i said i'm thinking about the longer term vision of tinder that i, I don't think that these that, that we're buying companies that would necessarily on their own empower or enable inclusivity but but it is a value system that we have in every company that we're looking at right so we're looking for companies that see the world that way um, or, or rather, we would probably not invest or buy a company that didn't see the world as diverse and inclusive. Mm -hmm. Cool. This isn't on the screen, but I'm going to ask Sir Kate. Since we're talking about inclusivity and we're talking about the fact that people's identities are complicated and cannot be reduced down to one thing, um, can you talk about this ampersand? Oh, example? certainly, yeah. <laughs> so, um, we at GLAD had launched a campaign, um, and it actually it, it's about working together and that, especially in the LGBTQ community, we are everyone. We are Muslims, <laughs> we are women, we are people of color, we are immigrants. Um, and so it really is about joining together and the power in and. Um, and, and so we've been wearing them. They were at, on the red carpet at the Oscars and on stage at the Oscars. And we've been really asking people just to sign up um, at GLAAD. It's 2 A's, G-L-A-A-D.org. Um, 
There you can participate and take action. On SB6, we have a letter that we're sending, um, and I think we have uh, close to 10,000 signatures on it, and we want to compile more and more, so share, 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 and also become part of the movement here, what's going on. Um, we really believe that um, no one is one identity, and that um, by by connecting together, we're, we have strength in that. And so we've just been talking a lot about that lately. I, I actually really love that concept because I'm not just transgender, like I am other things as well, as is Zachary. You know, it's like, I like the idea that it's highlighting that we're stronger together when we are inclusive and collaborating with each other, but also that each individual person is, you know, you cannot reduce me to one label, you know? Right, right. And that's what, when I came out, when I was, you know, young and working in publishing and was nervous to come out because I, I was told it was a career ender, like it came out and then I was gay and then I was rele relegated to whatever I was going to not be able to move through a career properly. Um, that was because I was just going to be known as gay, like how smart I was or inventive or what a marketing genius if I was one was was all going to be wiped away with one identity. And I think that also we're dealing now in a culture um, with especially focused on youth where diversity is a strength and being different is good. Where when I was growing up, I'm 45, when I was growing up, being different was bad. Sticking out was bad. And I think that that's changing more and more. Um, and I, and we were saying earlier that, you know, the young are going to save us from ourselves, and I really do believe that, that the, the way that they envision the world and the way that they see the future of this world is so powerful um, and prosperous that um, it's, it's really positive. It's what I look to for hope. Mm -hmm. And just briefly, um, Sarah Kate said earlier that you know it's when you know someone personally, and I forgot to reel out one of my favorite statistics. I don't think I said this. That today, nine out of ten people in this country say they personally know someone who's gay, lesbian, or bisexual, but only about sixteen percent say they personally know someone in their workplace or their family at school who's transgender. And yet, when you look at that, the sixteen percent number is the national number. But when you look at what that number is for younger people, it's much higher. I don't off the top of my head remember what it is, but it's way higher than sixteen percent because the youth are more accustomed to having transgender people in their school transgender friends and that to me is also really exciting and also the tender space is younger as well so more likely to kind of be in that wave um, there's a question here for Zachary about um, from a filmmaker who's working on a film project about poor rural less educated trans youth and how can we get this message of like acceptance and inclusion to marginalized communities? Do you want to take that one in two minutes? Great question. <laughs> Keeps me up at night sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, I think that it's so important that we use all of our platforms and that everybody use all of their platforms. Everybody has a different platform. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the work that I've been doing in the arena of media and entertainment is limited in its scope. I think that it's imperative that we we kind of put our boots on the ground and um, kind of do direct outreach um, to communities. So that's a, a, a big part of my ethos in Los Angeles. I think that um, having a relationship to um, underserved and marginalized youth especially, they need to be told that um, they are important and that they are at the center of the conversation and not on the sidelines. Um, I think that it's like swimming upstream, mm -hmm. um, being a, a gender nonconforming or a trans person um, in a world that has not created space for you. Um, so I think that uh, creating visibility is one step. Um, it's it's sort of an early step. I mean, I see kind of a long long game plan, and when I think about like my own kind of strategy in life, um, I think that it's going to take a lot of different strategies. Um, I think that this this Can strategy I? that Tinder is using is genius, yeah. actually, because it um, familiarizes a huge number of people to just like what trans people look like and the fact that we live in your communities and the fact that um, 
we are out and proud, and it's 2017. I just want to build on that for one second because something that we are doing at GLAD um, to get to more rural um, communities is that we are looking at C what's, what's known in Nielsen as C&D counties and that's in scoring. Um, and we're looking at what you could, there is a direct correlation between the shows that you watched and who you voted for on November 8th. And so what we're doing is looking at the shows that we might have not looked at so much so before and looking at what the visibility of the LGBTQ community is within those shows and really moving and talking to the showrunners and putting pressure on them to be have more inclusive storylines so that we are opening um, hearts and minds up. So I see that we're nearly out of time and I'm curious whether anybody had any last thoughts before I bring this to a close. Well, then I have a last thought, which is to, um, <laughs> because I also um, spend time working with transgender youth when I'm not at GLAAD, uh, right. and have for the last eight years. And I think that there's two thoughts I have. One, that s platforms like YouTube have made it possible for transgender youth to find each other, which I think is really powerful, because prior, well, transgender people in general, I think, were separated from each other and from the world at large prior to the internet because it was very difficult for us to find each other. And the internet in general just made it so much easier for transgender people to connect, to begin to share our stories, to begin to build community, to begin to build political action. And then for, you know, youth didn't ha don't have to wait around for Hollywood to write a great story about transgender kids and their transitions because they can find each other on YouTube, which I think is really a powerful wet tool. But on the other hand, um, they may be watching each other's stories on YouTube, but their friends at school aren't watching, their parents aren't watching, it's not reaching kind of the people who surround them. So we have to broaden it out as broadly as possible, like you said. And that also, all of this visibility, when I think about it in terms of the kids that I work with, to me it's really important because they cannot see often a future for themselves, like because it's not reflected around them anywhere. They don't know that it's even possible to be a grown up transgender adult who's in love and in a relationship and has a career and you know just goes about their daily lives sometimes talking about being transgender and quite frankly sometimes not. So to have people like you, Zachary, um, in the public eye who can show all the youth out there who are coming out at earlier and earlier ages that it is possible to be a successful, happy, well-adjusted transgender adult, I think is to me one of the most powerful aspects of visibility. So thank you for that. Thank you, Sean, for all of your leadership at Tender, for working with the community to make this platform so inclusive and to send a message to all of your users that transgender people are welcome at Tender. And thank you for Sarah Kate for being the best boss at GLAAD. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, leading <laughs> our charge to make the culture a more inclusive place. And thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you.